All right, we are finishing our Nehemiah series, and I have loved this series. How many of y'all have enjoyed just studying the story of Nehemiah? If you got a Bible, go to Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 9, 6 verse 9, and I want to title this message, A Holy Pivot, A Holy Pivot. Somebody say, Holy Pivot. Now, if you're an athlete, you might know what this word means, or maybe, maybe even if you're not an athlete, you know what the word means, but it, it means to make a shift, a change in your direction. When I mentioned this title to my wife, she was thinking about the episode on Friends, when they're trying to move the couch up the stairs, and he's going, pivot, 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 and he's like, I'm trying to pivot, and uh, they get stuck trying to move the furniture because he doesn't know how to pivot. Somebody say, make a pivot. The story of Nehemiah is a story, really, of a holy pivot, a moment where the nation of Israel had been disgraced, discouraged, defeated, and yet they were about to make a holy pivot to rebuild what the enemy had tried to destroy. And I've got a word for you today. Some of you are in a place similar to the nation of Israel, similar to the story of Nehemiah, where the enemy has tried to make you feel discouraged, defeated, addicted, broken down stuck, but God's saying it's time for a holy pivot. In Nehemiah 6, verse 9, it says they were trying to intimidate us. They were trying to frighten us from working on the wall. And they thought, if our hands get too weak, then we'll stop building the nation of Israel. It won't be complete. And I love this line right here. Nehemiah says, but I prayed. Somebody say, but I prayed. This is a pivotal moment. This was a pivotal decision where Nehemiah was faced with discouragement, criticism, intimidation, manipulation, but I prayed. He pivoted out of pessimism into prayer. He pivoted out of a problem into prayer. Somebody say, holy pivot. And when he prayed, he said, Lord, strengthen my hands. And God gave him supernatural strength. In verse 10, it says, one day I went into the house of my friend, And my friend said, let's go run into the temple. People are trying to kill you. You need to hide, Nehemiah. He began to prophesy, but it was a false prophecy. And Nehemiah said in verse 11, but I said, but is a pivotal word. You got to know that the the, the term but, we're talking about the right but, but is to change the direction of where the sentence is going. The sentence was going this way, but it shifted that way. Nehemiah said he was trying to scare me. He was trying to get me to run away from my calling. And he said, but I said, should a man like me run away? That's a line for some men in the room today. Should a man like Paul run away? Should a man like Ty run away? Should a man like Tony run away? Should a man like Caleb? No, God's called you to do a great work and you're not going to come down. He said, should someone like me run into the temple to save my life, I will not go. I'm sticking to my purpose. I realized that God had not sent my friend to prophesy on behalf of God, but he had been hired by my enemies to manipulate me out of my calling. That's a word right there. The enemy will use whatever means he can to pull you out of your calling, out of your purpose, off the wall. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin and they would discredit me and give me a bad name. But I love this in verse 15. He says, he, he says, after I pivoted, we rebuilt the wall in 52 days. If you're taking notes, note takers are history makers. Here's a word for you right here, just to write down. The faster the pivot, the faster the victory. The quicker the pivot, the quicker the victory. What should have taken five or six years to finish, Nehemiah and the, and the people of Israel finished in 52 days. And I just, I felt like the Holy Spirit was stirring me this week to just preach a word to the church. It's time to make a pivot for a season of acceleration in your marriage, in your family, in your finances. What should take six years to see a breakthrough, God says, by the end of 2023, things are about to shift. In 52 days, what the enemy thought couldn't be done. Come on, get ready, get ready. I just feel the Holy Spirit saying, get ready for acceleration. A holy pivot can change the whole game, can change the whole game. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us today on this word. 
and let us leave different than the way we came in. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Amen. I was watching my boys wrestle not too long ago, and they were in a wrestling match against Metro Christian Academy, and Liam was up against an opponent who was stronger than him, who had been wrestling longer than him, who probably could have won the match if only he could have kept Liam stuck. But Liam had a foot that was planted. In order to make a pivot, you got to have a planted foot. In basketball, if you're going to If you're going to pivot, you got to go like this. You have to have a planted foot. By the way, you can't make a holy pivot unless you're planted. Planted people make holy pivots. And so Liam pivoted in the wrestling match. The guy had him pinned. And I I grew up not wrestling because we didn't have a wrestling team back in my days at Victory. And uh, so I was trying to figure out what to tell Liam. I was like, come on, you can do it. Just take him down. But Liam knew what his coach had told him. It's a moment to make a pivot. If you pivot in the right moment, a pivotal decision can change the outcome of the match. And when he pivoted, he grabbed the guy and then he flipped him down and he took him to the mat and he won the match. I was proud of him. But here's the point. The quicker the pivot, the quicker the victory. Why do we take forever to make a pivot? Why does it take us so long to make a change. Now, I'm not talking about external pivots, because some of y'all might be thinking, okay, so so should I pivot out of my career? Should I change my job? Should I pivot out of my hair color? Should I go blonde? Should I pivot out of my marriage? Should I pick another spouse? Should I pivot out of my house? No, 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 no. Those external things, oftentimes we make the wrong external pivots, which lead to more problems in our life. It's an internal pivot that makes the greatest impact in your life. I'm talking about a spiritual pivot. I'm not talking about a physical pivot. I'm talking about something on the inside that you change. Our greatest fulfillment, our greatest impact, our greatest fruit will come from the holy pivots that we make. Paul and Silas made a holy pivot when they were stuck in a prison cell. And everyone around them was having a pity party. Everyone around them was pessimistic. Everyone around them was pouting. Everyone around them was chained up. But they pivoted into praise. And when they pivoted into praise, chains began to break. Praise is an internal decision, but it can make an external outcome in your favor. When you pivot out of your problem into prayer, when you pivot out of your circumstances into a place of praise and worship, just get ready. God's, I, I feel like God's saying, get ready for a breakthrough as you begin to make a holy pivot. David in the Bible, one day he was so depressed. Actually, he had a lot of days that he was depressed. <laughs> if you read through the book of Psalms, there's 150 Psalms, and a lot of them start off kind of sad, discouraging, depressed. In Psalm 42, he said, I was thirsty for God, and I didn't know where to go, and I was remembering the old days. Where is God? I remember when I would go into the church, he said in Psalm 42, verse 4. I remember the the beautiful songs of worship. And as he's writing this psalm, he's in a very discouraging place. He's feeling overwhelmed by life. He's feeling depressed. Now, maybe none of you in this room have been there before. But this is a pivot psalm. Halfway through the psalm, as he's throwing his pity party, like Eeyore on Winnie the Pooh, nobody likes me. Nobody's inviting me to their birthday party. It's always raining on me, never on anybody else. He pivots out of his pity party, and he says, put your hope back in the Lord. Trust in God. He's still on the throne. He's good. He's your redeemer. He's your rock. He's your shelter. Some of us need to pivot out of a pity party and back into a place of praise, back into a place of gratitude. Joseph in the Bible, he had to pivot. He had been betrayed by his brothers, sold as a slave, accused of a crime he didn't commit, thrown in a dungeon, forgotten by a butler, forgotten by others. Then by the time he finally gets promoted, after 14 years of hardship, seven years later, his brothers show up. It's been 20 years since he's seen them. And and if he's allowing bitterness and feelings to keep the, the, the focus in his life, then he would keep a stiff arm at him. He'd say, I don't want to talk to you. You guys are the ones that hurt me. But he actually says what the enemy meant for harm, God used it for good. Joseph pivoted his perspective of what people did to him. Instead of holding a finger as a victim saying, you hurt me, you betrayed me, he said, God used what you meant for harm to send me in the right direction, and I forgive you. 
He pivoted into forgiveness. Why do so many people have a hard time making a holy pivot? I want to give you six reasons why people have a hard time making a holy pivot. Number one, fear. Throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, fear is the stronghold that keeps so many people from pivoting in the direction that God's calling them to go. Fear, the fear of change, the fear of failure, the fear of rejection, the fear of hoping again, the fear of trusting people after you've been betrayed and heartbroken by people. This last summer, I, um, I went to Panama for a few days, and I found these really cheap tickets. Me and a buddy decided to go, and, and uh, every now and then, we'll try to take a trip together where we'll spend time praying and doing an adventure, turning off our phones, and just honestly, just getting alone with God in nature. And so normally it's about two or three days. We'll go to the Grand Canyon. Well, this time he was like, let's get out of the United States. Let's go to Panama. I was like, okay. And um, he said, I found these really cheap tickets and I got a place for us to stay that's only $10 a night. I was like, that's awesome. I didn't do any research. I just trusted him. So <laughs> he said, we're going to hike through the Chiagras rainforest um, southern Panama on the border of Colombia. And I'm, I, I don't know much about these countries. I'm like, yeah, sounds good, you know? Like, that's the cheapest trip I've been on. That sounds awesome. I could use a break, you know? So I go with him and meet up with him in Panama. He's like, I got this rental car for like 20 bucks a day. And you could tell we got it for 20 bucks a day. It was, it was a rough car. And he said, all right, we're going to hike through the forest about three or four hours, I found this mission base. We're going to stay tonight. Then we're going to hike to a waterfall, and there's jaguars there. When I landed there, there's no tourists. And I was looking around. I was like, there's no tourists here. We're the only Americans. Nobody spoke English. And I was like, how we, we don't speak Spanish, you know? So we start hiking through the forest, and um, we've been hiking. It's close to the equator. I'm sweating so hard. I'm like, I only brought one bottle of water. Not a good idea. And we literally collapse on the side of the road. And these guys are driving by. Now, right before we collapsed, I had my phone on for its final last few minutes. And I Googled, what's going on in Panama? Why are there no tourists here right now? And for whatever reason, what popped up was human trafficking, drug trafficking, major crime in this specific area of southern Panama. And I was like, oh, snap. Then my phone died. And then, <laughs> so I collapse. I'm getting ready for a holy pivot. But I collapse. I'm on the side of the road. I'm exhausted. I'm dehydrated. I'm out of water. My buddy Ryan and I were just staring at each other, and we're like, where is this mission base? This truck pulls up, these two guys, and they're like, eh. And I was like, eh. And, you know, they don't speak our language. I don't speak their language. I was like, can we come with you? You know, and he's like, I don't know what you're saying, but get in the truck. So we get in the truck. We don't know where we're going, but we get in the back of this truck. We got a picture of us that's sitting in the back of the truck. We drive through the jungle. We drive across this river. We get to the mission base. It's abandoned and nobody speaks English. And the two people that are there are about to leave. And we're like trying to talk to them. We're like, we have reservations tonight. And they're like, stupido americano, gringo loco. Idioto. I was like, I know what you're saying. You're calling me dumb. And so they call someone who speaks English and Spanish and they, they hand us the phone and the guy's like, mates, what are you doing there? And we were like, where are you from? He's like, South Africa. He goes, that mission base has been abandoned for four years. He said, it's dangerous there. Sickness everywhere. Jaguars everywhere. Get out of the blank jungle now. I was, this sounds like Jumanji. I was like, what's going on here? So I'm looking around. Nobody's there. It's an abandoned camp. And I'm like, Ryan, did you do research? He's like, yeah, I did research. Not much research, but I saw the Google ad and clicked on it. And it's not what it was supposed to be. So we had two days left, and we had to make a pivot. Somebody say, make a pivot. They said, if you don't get out of the jungle in the next couple hours, you could be eaten by jaguars tonight. So we hustled back up the mountain, two and a half hours, back to the car, finally got back to the car. We drove, and within a few hours, we drove the opposite direction. And when we did, we found the most beautiful waterfalls for the next couple of days where we were able to swim and hike around that forest area. But it never would have happened unless we made a pivot. Somebody said, make a pivot. So oftentimes, fear holds us back from making a pivot. The fear of being rejected, the fear of change, the fear of failure, the fear of trusting someone again and being let down. Secondly, I think 
what stops us from making a pivot is uncontrollable grief. Uncontrollable grief. When someone passes away, when someone leaves you, when something doesn't work out, and you're overwhelmed, and you just don't see a way forward, you're just grieving, and you feel discouraged. This happened to Joseph's father, Jacob. Jacob was overwhelmed with grief over his, his son, Joseph, when he thought Joseph died, when the brothers came back and told him, your son is dead, when he was actually alive, he was sold as a slave. But the Bible says Jacob lost his emotions, lost his feelings, and lost his desire to really live. He wanted to die. He didn't see a reason to keep on living. He didn't know how to pivot after the loss of his son. How many people get lost in grief? This happened to Samuel the prophet when he had chosen the first king of Israel, Saul. God God picked Saul because he thought Saul was the right king for Israel. But once Saul disobeyed God, it broke Samuel's heart because Samuel was the one who picked him. And he thought, I've made a mistake. I've missed it. I'm not a good prophet. And he was grieving. And there's a time to grieve. And then there's a time to move on. And in 1 Samuel 16, 1, God spoke to Samuel. It's time to stop mourning over Saul. Fill your horn with oil. Be on your way. I have a David waiting for you in Bethlehem. And I want to say this to someone who's lost someone, someone who's gone through something painful. They will never be replaced. But if you live the rest of your life stuck in grief, you'll never see what God has in front of you. you got to make a holy pivot. Samuel had to pivot out of despair, out of grief. I watched my mom do this after she lost her husband. I watched our family do this after we lost our dad. I watched our church do this after they lost their pastor. If we don't make a holy pivot, we'll get stuck in discouragement and depression and grief, and we won't know how to get out. The third reason, and this one's going to hurt, is laziness. Why do people not make a holy pivot? We don't want to get off the couch. We don't want to make a change. We just want to sit there and watch Netflix. Last night after I got done preaching, I came back to my office and I had a present waiting for me from Pastor Stephen Furtick. He always remembers my birthday. When I opened the present, it was this big old robe. And I pulled it out and I put it on. I got a picture of me just standing in this robe. (laughs) And I just couldn't stop laughing at this robe. And he said, this is what I wear after I get done preaching because I just want to sit on my couch in my robe. So this morning, he called me. He said, are you going to preach in the robe? I said, no. He said, I bet your church wants you to preach in that robe. How many of y'all want me to preach in that robe sometime? <laughs> but there's something about that, that, that robe that snuggle, that just you just want to stay in bed. You don't want to get out. Laziness keeps people from pivoting. An arrived mindset keeps people from pivoting. Thinking, I've been there, done that, bought the t-shirt, figured it out. This is it. I've retired spiritually. I've learned everything I need to learn. There's nothing new for me to learn. There's nothing new for God to do through me or in me or for me because I've arrived. And people who've arrived, they stop learning. They stop pivoting. They stop growing. They get stuck moving the furniture because they don't know how to pivot. They get stuck in an attitude. They get stuck in a mindset because they don't know how to pivot, which leads to my next point, stuck in the past. People get stuck in how things used to be. Paul, I miss the good old days, the glory days. I don't see anything great in the future. I don't know how to pivot. But Isaiah 41 says, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Forget the former things. It's not that the former things are bad or not good enough. They're great. But God didn't call us to live in a museum. God didn't call us just to build monuments and stand there and stare at the miracles of the past. God is up to something new and fresh and great. And he's reviving his church today. The Israelites had gotten stuck in what they used to remember about the temple. This is why when Zerubbabel started rebuilding the temple and Nehemiah started rebuilding the wall, the older generation was weeping looking at it. They weren't weeping with gratitude. They were weeping with anger, saying it's not as good as it used to be. And Ezra the prophet, Ezra the teacher, comes up and he says, the latter days will be greater than the former days. What God has in front of us is greater than what lies behind us. I know you've seen some miracles, Victory. I know God moved in the 80s and the 90s. I know when Oral Roberts was still alive and Billy Graham was still alive and Billy Joe Darty was still alive. Those were some good old days, but you ain't seen nothing yet, church. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Pivot out of the past 
and into the present and prepare your heart for what God has next. Don't get stuck in yesterday. Some people get stuck in waiting on God to do it all. I'm just waiting on God to rebuild the wall. Imagine if Nehemiah would have seen the broken down wall, wept, prayed, fasted, talked to the king and said, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray for the next 10 years that God somehow magically rebuilds Israel. No, Nehemiah knew, I'm not waiting on God. God's waiting on me. I'm not waiting on God to rebuild this wall. God's waiting on me to be the answer to the problem. So many people are waiting on God to fix their marriage, fix their problem, set them free from an addiction. But God's saying, go get in that rehab. Go to that discipleship class. Go position yourself for a breakthrough. Pivot towards being the solution to the problem instead of waiting on God to do it all. So many people won't pivot. Here's my last point right here because they're making excuses. You can make a pivot or you can make excuses, but you can't do both. Paul, I'm I'm not old enough. I'm not... I'm too young. I'm, I'm unqualified. I'm too old. I've missed my chance. I've, I've missed my opportunity. I missed my train. I'll never get married. We'll never have kids. It's never going to happen. I'll never break free of this addiction. I'll never start that ministry. I'll never fulfill that dream. You can make excuses or you can make a pivot, but you can't do both. It's time to make a holy pivot towards your breakthrough. Get ready for a breakthrough. Get ready. You're not stuck, my friends. I was on a hike with my kids not too long ago, and it was Liam, Benny, and Mac were hiking through the woods, and one of the kids goes, Dad, you're leaving me. I was like, what? I'm, I'm 10 feet in front of you. He goes, no, you're leaving me. He was screaming. He's really intense, and he was almost having a panic attack. I said, no, 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 we're not leaving you, buddy. We're right here. He said, I'm stuck, Dad, and you're leaving me. I can't move another foot, and I was like, is your foot stuck between rocks? He's like, no, I just don't see a way forward. That was literally what he said. I just can't figure out where to go next, and I'm stuck, and you're leaving me. And I said, no, 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 I'm not leaving you. So I walked back to him. I said, let me help you. And he said, no, 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 you can't. You're going to have to lift me up and carry me because I can't move. I said, are you paralyzed? He said, no, I just don't know where to go next. I said, take this foot and move it here. He said, I can't do that. I can't trust that rock. That rock's going to break my foot. I said, no, you can trust it. So I help him. He's like, okay, all right, that's not that bad. That's, yeah, that's sturdy. That's strong. You know, he weighs like 40 pounds. I'm like, it's not going anywhere. (laughs) And I said, take this foot, pivot here. Somebody said, make a pivot. He does that. I said, now take this foot, Bring it here, because we were walking on big boulders. We were out near the Arkansas River. And um, I said, now, jump here. He jumps there. And he looks up, and he says, Dad, I'm not stuck anymore. I'm not stuck. I said, you were never stuck. You just stopped. You were never stuck. You just stopped. You stopped pivoting. You stopped making the next step, because you didn't trust your father. You stopped following your father because you didn't trust his steps. How many believers aren't making a pivot because they don't trust God? They're not taking the next step because they're afraid. What if it doesn't work out? What if I fail? What if it ends up like the last situation? In Nehemiah, there were several pivots that I I think we should learn from. In Nehemiah chapter 1, he pivoted from hopelessness to hope. In the midst of crisis lies great opportunity for those who can see beyond the despair. Nehemiah was looking at what everyone else was looking at, and they were filled with hopelessness. But somewhere in the midst of his tears and his his, his fasting and his prayers, he gets to verse 8 through 11, and he says, God, you know how to restore what the enemy has stolen. You have a covenant with Israel, and I'm reminded that that covenant still stands that we are heirs of Abraham and that you made a promise. This is our land and you will regather this nation. All of a sudden, Nehemiah begins to stir his heart with hope. It's time to stir your heart to hope again. In Nehemiah chapter one, he pivots from a problem into prayer. The quicker we pivot out of our problems into prayer, the quicker we move from panic into peace. The quicker we pivot out of our problems into praise and prayer, the quicker we move from panic to peace. When he's faced with a problem, he turns it into a prayer. Paul the apostle says, if you got a problem, bring it to God. 
through supplication, petitions, and prayers, and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. A couple weeks ago, we were getting harassed as a family by someone, and police called us. They said, hey, what, what this person is doing is criminal, and this is wrong, and he's not just doing it to you. He's doing it to other families, and the police ended up having to apprehend him. But in, before they did, it was so intense, I felt anxious. I felt worried. I wasn't getting good sleep. I was, I was uptight. I was edgy because I was just thinking about this situation. I was like, what, what in the world? I don't even know this person. I've never talked to this person before. And they're way older than me. And I don't know why they're, they're doing this to our family and to other families. And it was intense. And it was a spiritual battle we were in. This was during the series of Nehemiah in the last two or three weeks. But Ashley and I, we took a moment and we just grabbed hands and we began to pray with authority. You can pray and then you can pray with authority. And we just begin to bind this harassment in Jesus' name. No weapon formed against our family shall prosper. Any tongue that rises against us stands condemned. In Jesus' name, we plead the blood of Jesus around our house, around our church, around the school, around the camp, around the college, around the Dream Center, around all of our children. In Jesus' name, we will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord. You can turn a problem into a prayer and you'll, you'll move from panic into peace. And that's what happened for us. We moved into peace. And that's what God wants to do for some of you today. In Nehemiah chapter 2, he pivoted from fear to faith. In fact, in verse 2, he says, I was afraid, but I decided to speak to the king anyways. Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is moving forward even when fear is staring you in the face. Faith is moving forward even when you have all the voices of fear. In Nehemiah chapter 2, he pivots from victimhood to being a visionary. I want the band to come up because we're about to pivot into worship here in just a minute. He pivots from being a victim, not just him, but the entire nation. They had been victims of a crime. All the nations around Israel had just ganged up and bullied and just beat down the nation of Israel, sent them into exile, made them slaves. And they could have just kept on talking about what they had gone through, what they had been through. And it's so hard and it's so painful and we've been treated wrong and it's unfair. And They could have just kept on talking about it. But instead, Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 2, verse 17, he said, I know we've been through a lot. You see the trouble that we've been through. Jerusalem lies in ruins. Our families have been beaten up. Our walls have been burned down. Our gates have been destroyed. But I say this day, let's rebuild. Let's move from fear to faith. Let's move from victims to victors. Let's stop talking about the problem and let's be the solution for our generation. All of a sudden, he gets filled with this visionary hope. And in verse 18, the people of Israel shouted back at Nehemiah, let's start building. Come on, Bob the Builder. Yes, we can. We can do it. It's time to move from being a victim to being a visionary. Get a vision for what God wants to do. They had to pivot from listening to critics to starting construction. In verse 19, those same people that had been criticizing Nehemiah all through it came and they said, who do you think you are? What do you think you're doing? My dad used to say, the dogs may bark. Roof, 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 roof. There it is. Who let the dogs out? The dogs may bark, but the train keeps rolling. Somebody say, choo, choo. Yeah, don't let the barking of a dog stop the vision from God. Keep the train rolling. I'm on the victory train. We're headed somewhere. Get ready. We got a future in front of us. It's time to pivot from listening to the critics to starting the construction on the vision that God's called you to do. So many of us are waiting to, to start the construction until we got everybody's approval. You'll never have everybody's approval. You'll never have 100% approval. As long as you have God and the right people in your life for you, you just, you just start that construction. You start moving towards that dream. Oral Roberts said this. He said, I wasn't the first guy that God asked to build that university. He said, I was the fifth guy. The first four. They couldn't do it because they were afraid of what people would think. They were afraid that it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't ever make an impact, a spirit-filled university in the middle of the United States. And he said, um, I was reading his book, and he said, I was the first guy that said yes, but I wasn't the first guy that God asked. I was just the first guy that 
decided to obey God instead of fear man. You can fear man or you can fear God, but you can't do both. Because if you fear God, then you have less weight on what everyone else has to say. You still listen. You listen to the right wisdom, the right advice, people that line up with the word of God and, and, and all of that, constructive help, constructive criticism. But then there's destructive criticism, just saying you're not qualified, you're not worthy, you're not good enough. We know about you. You're not the right person for that. You'll never see that thing come true. Oral Roberts, you got a stuttering problem. You, God can't use you. You can't speak. People would talk. Banks would tell them it can't be done. Bank after bank after bank said, we're not going to get behind this university. But here we are, almost 70 plus years later, and the university is in its strongest place it's ever been in. Just building and expanding and reaching people. Somebody say, don't stop. And Nehemiah 3, pivot from isolation to community. Pivot from isolation People were in their homes all by themselves. Nehemiah said, it's time to get in community. It's time to come out of your isolation. Stop being a shut-in and get connected to the, to the people of God. Someone called me this last week. They said, Pastor Paul, I love your sermons. I go to church at Victory, but I don't know anybody, and I need to get in community. I need a couple of guys sharpening me. I need iron sharpens iron. I need to be in a connect group. I, I need people who are challenging me, praying for me. I said, you called the right person. Let me get you connected to our men's discipleship. Within a few minutes, he had already made that next step to get plugged in right here at Victory with men's discipleship group. I just want to encourage you. This might be a big building, but we are a family. And it's very simple to get connected. You just have to pivot to make the effort. You got to pivot to make the effort to say, you know what? I'm going to get to know some people. I'm going to exchange numbers with some people. I'm going to go out to eat after church with some people. I'm going to invite the people in my row to meet up at my house later this week. I'm going to join one of those connect groups. We're going to get some married couples together. We're going to get some singles together. We're going to get some people that have walked through divorce together. We're going to get some people that are walking through all kinds of, whether it's single parent moms, single parent dads. We have groups for every different season of life, no matter where you are, what you've gone through. We got a group for you. But you got to pivot out of isolation into community. All right, let me keep going here. I got, I got a lot of more pivots to get through. <laughs> pivot from burned rubble to recycled rebuilding materials. Pivot from burned rubble to recycled rebuilding materials. God will use what's been burned in your life for something good. God will take the broken pieces and build something beautiful. This past week, my brother John preached on Wednesday night, did a powerful job. But afterwards, I called him. I said, John, what do you think about the story of Nehemiah? He said, isn't it interesting that God used burned rubble, burned up bricks to be the same bricks that would rebuild the nation of Israel? He said, Paul, how many people in our church have been burned, have been beaten up, broken down, discarded. One man's trash is another man's treasure. What the world has said trash, God says that's treasure. Your mess is a message. Your test is a testimony. Your scars are going to be used for God's glory to shine bright for the world to see that he uses what, what the world says is broken. I was talking to a man after church. He said, did you know that burned bricks actually hold stronger in place? That the hotter the bricks, the, the more heat they've been through, the more intensity they've been through, the more burned they are, the stronger they are to hold together. Come on, that's a testimony for someone who's been burned a lot. You're about to be a big part of what God's doing. Pivot from discouragement to encouragement. Stop letting the devil beat you up every single day with discouragement. you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. You know, this past, uh, yesterday, I was dropping my son off at a birthday party, and after I did, I was driving up to the church about 9.30 in the morning, and, and I started getting discouraged, and I could just, like, lies of the enemy were coming, and I, I could hear the enemy just saying, you're getting old, you're almost 40, you got a few years left in your life, and I was like, no, I'm still young, come on, give it up for those that are still young in your 40s and 50s and 60s, you're still young, 70s and 80s and 90s, we're still young. But I just felt the enemy saying, your best days are behind you. Your best sermons are behind you. Your best breakthroughs are behind you. Your best years are behind you. And I was like, no, 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 no. But I was letting the enemy just discourage me. And I started driving across the city of Tulsa. I forgot where I was going. Have you ever been so distracted you just start driving places and you forget where you're going? Yeah, that's where I was. I was, I don't know where I was. I was just driving around Tulsa for 30 minutes just listening to the discouragement. And then I just started playing like sad songs. 
There's this song from like Ginny Owens in, in the ni- early 1990s where she's like, I'll walk through the fire if you want me to. And it's just a song about like going through the bad times of life. And, and then it was like Michael W. Smith looking for a reason, trying to find my place in this world. Like I don't know who I am and I forgot my place and my purpose. And I was just discouraged. I was just having an emo fest in my car, just emotions, feelings, just letting my feelings drive the car. That's what David did sometimes in the Bible. Just let his feelings take over. But then he had to pivot out of the pity party. Pivot out of that Eeyore spirit. And say, hold on. God is good. And I am blessed. And I am so thankful. Because the truth is, this past year has been the best year of my life. And I feel like I'm stepping into my best years yet. And I can't wait to get older. It's an adventure. I'm excited. I really am. I'm like, let's go. I don't know. I'm just, I had to tell the devil, shut up, devil. My best days are not behind me. They're in front of me. I'm more than a conqueror. I can do all things through Christ. You got to pivot out of that discouragement and encourage yourself in the Lord. Pivot from being weary from the work to being ready for the battle. I got a a sword and a hammer here. Something Nehemiah had to do. Daniel, will you hold this? Something Nehemiah had to do is they were getting attacked by enemies that were bigger and stronger than them. Israel actually was down to 10% of their nation was actually living at that time in Jerusalem. 90% had either died or resettled in other countries during the exile. And so he said, "I I need you to work and to fight. Now, they were tired. They told Nehemiah, we're too tired. We're losing sleep. We can't do this. We're discouraged. We've been working for 27 days straight here. We're seeing, I mean, they had already finished half the wall. They had about 25 days left. Nehemiah knew we can finish this, but we're going to have to work and we're going to have to fight. So he gave them swords, spears, and bow and arrows. And then he gave them hammers and nails and all the materials to build. He said, in one hand, you're going to build. And in one hand, you're going to fight. He pivoted the people of Israel. Now, I've been in places where I've been so tired, I don't feel like I can keep going, but then I get a second wind. There's been times where I've been running, jogging outside, and I'm just like, oh, I can't keep going. But then, like, there's a thought, there's something that lights a a second wind, and all of a sudden, I feel like, oh, I could keep going another mile. I could keep going another 30 minutes. It's, it's, It's like a runner's high. It's something that happens in athletes when they get a second wind. And they feel like we could keep going. The Israelites got a second win when Nehemiah said, I'm going to equip you with tools and weapons. You are not alone. And the Lord is fighting for you. That's what Nehemiah told them. When they heard that, the enemies got discouraged. And they lost their confidence because the Israelites got a second win. Some of y'all are about to pivot to your second win. Get ready for victory. Get ready for victory. They had to pivot from being divided to united. They had to pivot from distractions to focus. I'm just going to go through this quickly, and you can look at it later, or you don't have to. But I want you to receive this in your spirit. Just just get this in your spirit. Pivot from intimidation from the lies of the enemy to power and confidence from the truth of God's word. Pivot from listening to the lies of the enemy to tuning into what does God have to say about me? What is God speaking over me? Pivot from being recklessly always open to strategically shut doors. Nehemiah began to set boundaries. What was the wall of Israel for? Before he built the city, he built the wall. Why? Because he understood the nation of Israel had been burned down. They needed boundaries. They needed They needed doors that were closed so the enemy couldn't keep coming in. Some of you have been in a place of open borders. The enemy just does whatever he wants. But it's time to put some strategic shut doors over the gates in your life. He actually put praise and worship leaders, he put the Levites in front of every gate, in front of the mouth gate, the eye gate, the ear gate. He said, we're gonna strategically place worship so that when our enemies come like a flood, they're met with the sound of victory. They're met with the sound of praise. Pivot from sadness to joy. Pivot from pessimism to praise. Pivot from grief 
to gratitude. There's this moment in Nehemiah chapter eight where they're all sad. And Nehemiah says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. This is a holy day. This is not a day to stay depressed. This is not God's funeral. No, 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 my friends. It's time to celebrate. It's time to get your joy back. It's time to get your laughter back. It's time to get your life back. Come on, stand to your feet all over this place. Here's my last point right here. Pivot from defeated to victory. Pivot from being beat down and defeated to rebuilding towards victory. And the faster the pivot, the faster the victory. In 52 days, they rebuilt the wall. What the world thought couldn't be done, what the world thought would take six to 10 years to do, they did in 52 days. They pivoted from being beaten down and defeated to rebuilding towards victory. And I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to show you this clip. I want you to start it from the very beginning because there was this football game that happened several years ago. And it's one of the craziest comebacks in the history of football where a team had been down and they were, there was only two seconds left and they were told, man, you could keep playing. They were told, this is the end of the game. In fact, the marching band of the other team started coming out on the field to declare that they had won the game. But I want you to see what happens as this team that had been beaten down, defeated, the game is ending, the score clock is running out. They begin lateraling the ball. Seven different times they lateral the ball back to the next guy, back to the next guy. They refuse to quit. They run over the marching band. They say, get your marching band off my field. The game's not over. It's not over. It's not over. You need to tell the devil today, it's not over. It's not over. God's not finished with me yet. My best days are not behind me. I want you to just close your eyes all over this place. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but I believe someone needs to hear this today. It's time for a holy pivot out of discouragement out of that pity party and into praise and worship, out of worry and into singing, worthy is the lamb, out of that place of depression and into that place of hope to believe that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you ask, hope, dream, or imagine. God says it's time to get your hopes back up. It's time to start moving towards victory. It's time to move out of apathy, move out of laziness, move out of addiction, and pivot towards victory, pivot towards freedom. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're here today, and the Lord's calling you to make a holy pivot, I want you to raise your hand all across this room. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. From the front to the back, it's time for a holy pivot. You know what it is. The Holy Spirit's telling you exactly what the pivot is. You know where to make it. You know what it needs to do. You know even the attitude that needs to shift. You know the time that you need to take. You know, you know the words you need to speak. You know the scriptures you need to say. And the, the Lord is saying it's time for a pivot. God says if you'll pivot, watch what I'll do in heaven. Watch all of heaven pivot with you. Watch the power of heaven get behind you, Nehemiah, as you put your hand to the plow, as you put your hand towards the dream, as you put your, as you bring your knees to the altar. God says, watch the power of heaven pivot with you. If you're here today and you're not right with the Lord, you need to surrender and ask Jesus into your heart. Raise your hand. Today's your day. Salvation is knocking on the door of your heart to get right with God, to repent of your sins, to let the Holy Spirit lead you, to let Jesus be Lord of your life. If you raised your hands for either of those or you need to get to the altar today, would you leave your seat right now? Come and join us right here at the front of the stage at this altar and let's cheer on brave men, brave women, boys and girls, moms and dads, grandparents, pastors, leaders, friends. Come on, let's just pivot into worship. Let's just pivot into praise. Let's pivot towards trusting in the Lord. You take what the enemy meant for you. You turn it for good. What the enemy sent to destroy me, you're going to use, God, to deploy me. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, pivot towards praise. Pivot towards praise. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. Turn it for good. Jesus, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn, you turn it 
just came to my spirit. Sing that song again. You take what the enemy meant for evil, but you turn it for good. On this part right here, I want you to turn with me. Turn it for good. Come on, make a pivot. Turn it for good. Yeah, let's sing that again. You might just do a whole circle. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn in for good. Come on, where the enemy thought he had you stuck, you're about to make a holy pivot. You're about to see a flip on the script of what the enemy wrote for your life. God is not finished with your story. God's going to use what the enemy tried to send against you to make you stronger, to make you sharper, to make you trust in him more. There's a song we used to sing when I was in high school. It's a song written by a guy right here in this city. And when he wrote this song, I got to talk to him. He said, I wrote it because I was in a place of despair and I needed to, I needed to change things. I needed to see a turnaround. So he said, I started thinking about moving from one thing to the next thing, moving from this to that. So he said, I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading. Shame, I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Yeah, he was pivoting out of despair. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm trading. I've been talking about my pain way too long. I'm laying it down for the joy of the Lord. Some of us need to shake free of some stuff. So we're going to get kind of low. Get a little low. Say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Let's bring it up now. Yes, Lord. Yeah, tell the enemy he doesn't win. You're pivoting out of that despair. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. I'm saying yes to your love, yes to your joy, God, yes to your love, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Pastor Sharon, are you still here? All right, so my mom, she taught me how to worship. She was the worship leader of Victory. She's the OG. She's the original gangster worship leader of Victory. And she used to have a a Victory shuffle, like a Victory shake. And we would, Sarah, Ruthie, me and John, we would watch her do her Victory dance. You used to have a song called Turn It Around. Turn it around. Don't let the devil get you down. You gotta turn it around. Turn it around. You can turn your troubles around. Come on, we should just have a victory dance party in here. (laughs) Somebody say, Holy Pivot! All right, so here's the encouragement. This week, practice a holy pivot. When you feel depressed, discouraged, overwhelmed, you've lost your joy, just think of Pastor Sharon doing that dance. And you just sing, turn it around, turn it around. Don't let the devil 
get you down, you gotta turn it around, turn it around. Don't let the... What's that next part? Say that. Turn all your troubles around. Turn all your troubles around. Turn all your troubles around. Lord, I just pray that you would help all of us this week to practice a pivot spiritually, God, where there's been trouble, where there's been discouragement, where there's been sickness, pain, shame, pity parties, just lies of the enemy. I pray that we would flip it, that we would make a holy pivot this week. And God, we would begin to just turn on the praise and worship music in our car, that we would turn a problem into prayer. That we would start encouraging ourselves when we're driving in the car and we're feeling discouraged or distracted. That we would just start speaking scripture. And I just speak this over someone who's watching online right now. This this is going to be one of those messages you play over in your car. And you remind yourself, pivot, pivot, pivot. You can break out of this. You can turn your troubles all around. Don't let the devil get you down. Turn it around. Just pray this with me. Say, Jesus... I surrender to you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for giving your life for me. You died on the cross. You rose from the grave. You're my Lord and Savior. And you love me. And you have good things for my life. My best days are right in front of me. I have victory in my life because you live in me. I repent of my sins. I receive your forgiveness. God, you're not finished with me yet. In Jesus' name.